Wait, John, just one more cast. I shouted to my friend as we stood in our waders in the mouth of the Salmon River where it entered Lake Ontario. It was the second consecutive year that we had come north to Pulaski, New York to go salmon fishing over the Columbus Day weekend. The previous year we had fished Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and together caught one fish, a 26-inch salmon, and John caught it. Now it was the last day of our second trip, and we didn't have much daylight remaining. John had caught another salmon the day before, so the score was 2 nothing. But who keeps score, right? Men do, about everything and anything. Just one more cast, I shouted. I cast my line out, way out into the depths of the mouth of the river. I used my best form, and when I released the line, I was on my tiptoes to get that little extra push. Picture perfect. I set my drag and began to retrieve my line. And suddenly my line hung up, probably stuck on the rocks, I thought. But then I heard that sound that is music to any fisherman's ears. Zzzz. It's the sound of your line being taken by a fish. Good fishermen know that you must let big fish run with your line for a while to tire them out. And then you gradually retrieve them. And it can take a significant amount of time. I had a fish on my line. I pulled back my rod to be sure, and the fish jumped out of the water, five feet out of the water. Fifty yards or more away, the fish was huge. Please, God, please, God, help me to land this fish. I kept reeling in, and it kept trying to swim away. It was an exhaustive struggle. It took me almost an hour to get him to shore. He was a massive salmon. It was nearly dark. As we walked the mile back to our car, the salmon was 43 and a half inches long and somewhere around 25 pounds. He was so long and so heavy that I carried him back to the car over my shoulder. So with a stringer that made him a little bit longer yet, I had to be careful that the fish was not dragging on the ground. Honest. What a great day. Unfortunately, most of my fishing experiences didn't end that way. I once went fishing in the Florida Keys, actually twice, over two spring breaks while I was in college. We caught nothing. I caught nothing to shout about, just a baby shark. I spent an entire day one day on Pymatuning Lake from sunrise to sunset and got skunked, not even a nibble. I unsuccessfully fished Lake Arthur and also the Yawk River near where I grew up and also the Allegheny River. I always tried to think like a fish. Where would I hang out? What would I want to eat today? But that didn't work. Sometimes I would talk to them. That didn't work either. And when I was unsuccessful, I almost always thought of a passage of scripture, thinking that maybe Jesus was speaking to me, Davy Streets. Only Jesus calls me Davy and gets away with it, by the way. Davy Streets, throw your line to the other side of the boat, and there ye shall catch fish. When fishermen aren't catching fish, they'll try anything to change their luck. They will change lures. They will change the weight on their line. They'll fish the bottom. They'll fish the surface. They'll reduce the weight. They'll go from artificial bait to live bait. They'll go from live bait to artificial bait. They'll change locations. They'll move the boat. And yes, they will cast their line off of the other side of the boat just in case Jesus may know something that they do not. Our scripture for today records the third time that Jesus has appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Let's count them. The first time was when the disciples were together behind closed doors without Thomas. And the second time was when Thomas was present. Diane spoke to that last week. 
and Thomas saw the wounds of Christ and believed that he was raised from the dead. I like this third time because it appears that the disciples are trying to get back to normal. They're trying to get back to things the way things were before Jesus entered their lives. They're still hanging out together. At first, they were afraid that soldiers might come after them, so they huddled together. They hid behind locked doors. And then I suspect, I suspect that their fear began to deteriorate into boredom. And then Peter, looking for something to do, announced, I'm going out to fish. They are natural-born fishermen who apparently still have their boat because Scripture says they went down and got into the boat into, instead of saying they got into a boat. Out into the water they go, and pretty soon they are doing what is second nature to them, casting their nets onto the Sea of Tiberias, which is also the Sea of Galilee, which is also Lake Galilee, which is also Lake Tiberias, all the same body of water. They have fished through the night, as commercial fishermen generally do, but they haven't caught any fish. And so as morning arrives, some guy standing on the shore questions their success. Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Scripture says they did so. Scripture does not record their thoughts or their murmurings. Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? If he knows so much about fishing, why isn't he out on his own boat doing it? You know what they say, right? Those who can fish, those who can't teach people how to fish. But something inside of them leads them to follow his advice. Let's, let's try once more. What can it hurt? What if he is right? So they cast their nets to the other side and bam, they get slammed with fish. Fish, fish and more fish. Tons of tilapia. No, really, they probably were tilapia. Tilapia are the primary fish in the Sea of Galilee. And if you go to the Holy Land and you order St. Peter fish, it is tilapia that they bring to you. Anyway, they caught lots of fish. Have you ever visited the causeway at Pima Tuning? Pima Tuning Lake where you can feed the fish at the causeway? People bring bread or, or they buy food at the dispensers there. There are fish upon fish upon fish, literally. They are so dense that the ducks who also want the food can almost walk across the backs of the fish. Fish on top of fish. I think it was like that in this story for the disciples. And so the disciples must have been giddy with excitement. They had so many fish they couldn't get a hold of the net for fear of tearing the net and losing the catch. There were 153 fish. And so they decided to drag the net to shore rather than bring the net on board. Be careful. Whatever you do, be careful. We do not want to lose any fish. Careful, slowly, careful. And at some point, someone says, you know, there's something fishy going on here. And then John remembers the guy on the shore, puts two and two together and says, it's the Lord. Of course it's the Lord. How else could this happen? And we thought we were just really good fishermen. By this time, Jesus has built a fire, and he has asked the disciples to bring some fish to cook. And then we read in verses 12 and 13 what happens next. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and also ate some of the fish. This was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now friends, this event occurs in the in-between period of the lives of the disciples. Jesus has been crucified and raised from the dead, but he has not yet changed his disciple or charged his disciples with the task that's before them that will come 
with the Great Commission and his appearance to them as recorded in the book of Acts. And so they have lived through being disciples of Jesus, through following him everywhere, through seeing his crucifixion, through experiencing his resurrection. And in this story, at least, they are living life after Jesus, sort of trying to get back to normal. But once again, Jesus interrupts their lives. They have walked with Jesus for three years. They have learned from him. They watched him perform miracles. They saw him suffer and die and then rejoiced when he came back to life. So when Jesus breaks into their lives again, it is as if he is saying, sorry guys, there is no going back to normal. We are not going back to the B.C. days, those days in your life before I Christ entered into your lives. Things are different now. Are we tempted to do the same? After we have our initial encounter with Jesus, is there a sense inside of us that now we need to get back to normal? You know what today is? Today is the third Sunday of Easter. Now, we might be tempted to think that today is the second Sunday after Easter. But if you look at the top of your bulletin, you will see that it isn't. We are living in the season of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and in the season of the victory over sin and death. You know, on Easter Sunday, we were full, right? You were here. 1,170 17, 1,117 people attended three services here on Easter. Every service was packed. Last Sunday, 440 people attended. Of course, we had a bunch of people at a retreat, 50 or 60 people at a retreat at Jamonville as well. Why were more people not in attendance last week? I have some suggestions. Because the orchestra wasn't playing. Because we had a different preacher. Because people knew that the narthex would be torn up. People knew that we would not sing the Alleluia Chorus two weeks in a row. The Easter flowers would be gone. It wasn't Easter anymore. Easter was over. But you see, friends, Easter isn't over. Easter is never over. We always live in the after Jesus was raised from the dead. Every Sunday is Easter. And every Sunday is intended to be another celebration of Easter. You learn that when you go to seminary, but you shouldn't have to go to seminary to learn that. Every Sunday is intended to remind us that Jesus is alive and that God reigns over all. As a matter of fact, just two verses before our scripture for today, we find these words. This would be at the end of John's 20th chapter. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The disciples go out to fish and Jesus shows up. He does a miracle as if to say, just in case you forgot, I'm still around. Jesus overburdens their nets with 153 fish as if to say, Just in case you think it's over, it isn't over. Jesus enters into their transformed lives once again as if to say, I am still entering and still transforming lives, and once I'm in, I never leave. You can ignore me, but I never leave. I am always there. 
I, I think most of us drift in and out of relationships with Jesus. Our relationship. One day we feel close to him, and the next day we feel so far away from him that we wonder if he remembers who we are. But then suddenly something happens. A prayer is answered. Or God's presence is felt. Or someone comes and stands by your side. A need for Jesus is realized, and once again we see Jesus standing on the shore. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Friends, it is still Easter. It will always be Easter. It will never not be Easter. We live in the period after Jesus was raised from the dead. His resurrection is proof that this is God's world and nothing can thwart God from his purpose of drawing all people unto him. Jesus came for you. He suffered and died on your behalf and he overcame death for you, for us so that we may be reunited with the Father, so that we would know that he is always a part of our lives. He is always with us. Jesus appeared to Mary and to the disciples so that they would believe. We have their testimony, but Jesus also shows up in our lives again and again that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we may have life in his name. Make room for Jesus in your lives. Reserve a place for him and watch. Watch for his not-so-subtle reminders that he is always there and that he has never left.